Hello, my name is Daryl Press. I'm a professor in the government department here at Dartmouth, and I am the faculty director of the Initiative for Global Security here at the Dickey Center. It's my great pleasure to um, welcome our guest, Dan Byman, and our good friend, Professor uh, Ben Valentino, um, for a conversation about the ongoing and tragic war in the Middle East. Um, Dan Byman is a professor at Georgetown, and he's director of the Security Studies Program at the Walsh uh, School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. He's a senior fellow at the um, Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institute, and also a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I didn't know you could do both at the same time, Dan. I'm, I'm, I'm not at Brookings anymore. Oh, he's not at Brookings anymore. <laughs> um, he served as a, a staff member on the 9-11 Commission, and his bio very modestly says that he's the author of several, without counting his numerous books, on the topic of counterterrorism, conflict, and terrorism in the Middle East. Dan is quite simply a leading authority on US foreign policy toward the region, and he is a voice of calm and moderation among a sea of turmoil and anger on very emotional topics. It's a great, great pleasure to have him here. Um, we're gonna have a conversation between Dan and our very own Ben Valentino. Ben is professor of government in the, in the uh, Department of Government here at Dartmouth. He's also chair of the government department, and he is also the coordinator of the War and Peace Studies program here at the Dickey Center. And I think what they plan to do is have a conversation for 30, 35 minutes or so. And what that means is there will be substantial time for conversation and questions and discussion from the audience. So hold your questions if you would till they're done, but they will definitely turn toward you and you'll have plenty of time to ask questions. Um, with that, let me turn it over to you, Ben. And once again, thank you, Dan, for coming to, to Dartmouth. Thank you, Daryl. Um, thank you all for coming here today. I want to thank Dan again uh, for showing up. It's a great pleasure to have him here. I've known Dan for 30 years, um, and uh, over that time, he has uh, repeatedly confirmed that he is one of the sharpest minds in our country on the issues we're going to talk about today. Um, so I think um, you really are uh, in for some, um, some learning this afternoon. I want to say one thing. Uh, thing before uh, we begin our discussion on the, the substance with uh, Dan. And that's just that as anybody who's been following discussions uh, about these kinds of issues, the events in Israel and, and Gaza on college campuses um, uh, knows, those discussions at many of our peer institutions have not been um, going so well. They've been struggling um, with respect and civility and compassion to carry out these uh, uh, important conversations. But you probably also know that here at Dartmouth, we've been doing at least somewhat better uh, on that uh, account. And in large part, I think that's because of what I see as a genuine commitment of our students and our faculty to respectful dialogue, even about issues where we disagree quite uh, profoundly. Uh, and I expect that will um, continue um, here today. The issues that are dividing Israel and Palestine right now, of course, are not going to be resolved uh, here. They're not going to be resolved on any American um, college uh, campus. And that's true regardless of how we conduct ourselves when we discuss uh, those issues. That's not uh, a subject that we can solve for ourselves. But one thing I just uh, can't help but think is that if we can't manage to have a discussion about these issues with some level of respect and civility for people on both sides, how can we expect um, those uh, thousands of miles away, much closer to the suffering um, that these conflicts have visited on those populations, how can we expect them to have that conversation? So I think for us, um, it's quite important that um, we manage that, and I expect we will um, today. So with that said, I want to um, uh, begin, uh, Dan, with a few questions for you. And I think we can start with, um, with Hamas and, and, and who Hamas is, what Hamas is. Can you describe the Hamas movement to some extent? What's their organization in Gaza? What's the relationship of Hamas to the Palestinian people? in Gaza? Uh, so Hamas grows out of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the oldest modern political Islamist 
movement in the Arab world. And it's very much tied to the Brotherhood in um, Egypt initially, and then when Gaza goes from being Egyptian controlled to Israeli controlled, um, the Brotherhood takes on much more of an active life. Um, somewhat ironically, there's much more freedom to operate under Israeli control than there had been under Egyptian control before that. Uh, but really, I think a lot of the story people are interested in uh, begins in the first Intifada in 87 when Hamas effectively declares itself. And from the start, it's part of this very contentious Palestinian national movement uh, where there's a lot of competition for leadership. And Hamas, as I think everyone here knows, is both a mix of religious and nationalist. It wants a Palestinian state. Uh, but to be clear, it's not fighting for you know, uh, religious states uh, around the Middle East. It's very focused on um, what it would call Palestinian territory. Um, I can kind of drag you through um, really decades of, of history. And for those interested in Hamas, either as a social movement, as a militant group, as a terrorist organization, it's actually fascinating because it changes so much. Right? The organization is very different in 87 from where it is in 92, from where it is in 2000, from where it is in 2005. Uh, but I'll, I'll note a few things. Um, in 2005, when Israel withdraws from Gaza, um, Hamas, uh, excuse me, in 2005, uh, there are Palestinian elections. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my dates here. Uh, in 2005, when Israel withdraws from Gaza, um, Hamas is empowered, right? And it is uh, very strong in Gaza, and there are elections. And it's expected that Hamas's opponents, um, now with the Pal uh, Palestinian Authority, will win. Um, and Hamas actually wins the elections. Now, the elections themselves are actually very contested. Hamas does not win a majority, but it's a much better organized group than its rivals. Um, there is a power struggle in Gaza, and Hamas seizes power in 2007. And so since 2007, in a political science definition, Hamas is the government of Gaza. Right? And as someone who studies terrorism, this is always a tricky issue because there are aspects of Hamas that are terrorism. But a lot of what Hamas does is run Gaza on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but Hamas also has a presence in the West Bank. It also has a presence in the Palestinian diaspora. And these are different presences, and they have different rules. But in Gaza, it's very much a government. And since that initial election, there haven't been Palestinian elections. Right? So there's a, legit, a true question of who represents the Palestinian people. And we don't have a great answer for that. Right? We have international answers of who the international community recognizes to represent the Palestinian people. But who the Palestinians choose to represent the Palestinian people, um, we don't have, I would say, a true, clear, legitimate voice. I think that's good uh, to set the stage. Then the next obvious question, I think, is what do we know about Hamas's thinking as regards the attacks of October 7th? In other words, what do we know about their goals um, behind those attacks? Um, why uh, did there appear to be a shift in Hamas's uh, tactics, which although they'd not been uh, nonviolent, they'd launched rockets over the preceding years, nothing on this right. scale. Um, uh, for quite a few years. Of course, nothing on this scale ever in Israeli history, but um, large-scale attacks like this. And then it seems like something changed. What do we know about what Hamas was hoping to achieve by launching these attacks? Uh, so uh, let me start out by saying simply, um, I did not anticipate this scale of attack. Right? So what I'm saying is the wisdom of hindsight, not something that I feel was you know, clear at the time, or at least that I recognized. Um, so the assumption about Hamas that I had, and I think uh, many people around the world had, was it was an organization that had learned caution. That because it was the government of Gaza, um, it was trying effectively to govern. And as such, there was a conflict between Hamas, the militant ideological movement, and Hamas, the government. And uh, Sheikh Yassin, who was the uh, founder of Hamas and spiritual leader, um, I have a colleague who once called it, it was a struggle between Sheikh Yassin and Max Weber, the great sociologist who wrote about kind of theories of the state. And was Hamas a government or was it a resistance movement? And it was kind of trying to be both. But the assumption was the logic of governance was what was winning, and that it was more concerned about trying to expand the number of workers 
uh, going from Gaza into Israel to expand the fishing boundaries. Um, and uh, it was trying to keep its resistance credentials alive, but in a limited way. And obviously, that was wrong and dramatically wrong. Um, a couple things that we now think, but I want to stress that these are fairly speculative. These are not things, I, we'll rewrite this in five years. Um, so one theory out there initially was this was done at the behest of Iran. And to be clear, Iran has funded, armed, and trained Hamas, but it does not seem that Iran was behind the October 7th attacks in any direct sense. You know, broader providing capabilities, but not in terms of actually launching the attacks. Um, there is also a question of ideology, where Hamas simply wanted to hurt Israel. And I think there is a certain truth to that. I don't think that was the only reason or close to the only reason. But the idea of dealing a blow to Israel was certainly there. And there was a broader sense of um, Israel is, you know, um, as a nation, quite successfully um, having a social and economic life while the Palestinians are not. And Israel is having this kind of crazy political dynamic that's leaving the Palestinians behind. And uh, there was a sense of anger and resentment. I think that was more broadly true among many Palestinians than among Hamas as a government or as a political movement in particular. Um, I would say there are two things to me that stand out of why I think Hamas attacked when it did. Now, one was a desire to uh, get Palestinian prisoners. And uh, there are thousands of Palestinians um, in Israeli jails. And this is an important part of the movement. And this is something, these are people who were kind of fighters, who were highly dedicated. Um, and there was a sense that uh, they should not be forgotten. And part of the purpose of this mission was to take hostages. And in the past, Israel has done very large exchanges for one Israeli soldier. So capturing a dozen hostages would be a remarkable operational success, right? If we were going back on October 7th and we said, can you believe it? Hamas captured five Israelis that day. That would seem like a big deal in a pre-October 7th world. Um, in addition, there is a struggle within the Palestinian national movement over the question of who should be leading it. And you have Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority on the West Bank. Um, and the Palestinian Authority, as I think many people know, uh, has a lot of problems. Um, it is a corrupt organization. It is um, a, uh, has uh, tremendous leadership rivalries. Abbas himself is not a very dynamic leader. Uh, but Israel's policies have tremendously undermined it further. So you know, I'm not sure how much blame to assign to the Palestinian side versus the Israeli side, but Israeli policies deliberately, at times, humiliated the Palestinian Authority. Um, and a very basic function of governance on the West Bank is, you know, could the Palestinian Authority protect their people? And you had Israeli settlers doing pogroms on the West Bank. It was, it was quite grim. And so the Palestinian Authority was discredited. Um, but Hamas was discredited, too, because Hamas was not governing Gaza effectively, and Hamas was not an effective resistance organization. So you had two different movements that both had serious problems. And with striking a decisive blow against Israel, Hamas dramatically restored its resistance credentials. Now, obviously, it gave up on the governance side, right? But it said, OK, we are uh, very effectively a resistance organization. Um, and in many ways, especially on the West Bank, which is not bearing the brunt of the re retaliation the way Gaza is, um, that's worked, right? Hamas's popularity has soared on the West Bank. So it's able to make that claim to leadership. And this is at a time when the leadership is in question. I mentioned there haven't been elections in a while. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas is 88 years old. Um, he's a chain smoker. Now, I've been saying that line for a while. Like five years ago, I probably said when I was at Dartmouth last, Mahmoud Abbas is 83 years old. He's a chain smoker, right? So, um, and I learned on a recent trip to Israel, his father lived to be like 107. So, you know, he may be around. But um, that said, um, it's quite possible that the more traditional pro-Western leadership may collapse and Hamas would be well positioned to take over. Um, but one thing that is a little unclear is how much did Hamas expect to succeed? Um, so this was a massive attack. Um, but I would have told you wrongly that it probably would not work very well. That if Hamas, you know, if, if um, I had read about this, I would have said, you know, a few guys might get through, but Israel will stop them. And I think Hamas's goal was inflict some casualties, get a few hostages, and that will be some form of success. 
And had there been a much lesser scale of the devastation on the Israeli side, I think you'd be seeing very different political dynamics in all those very different conflict dynamics. Um, and uh, the question of what Hamas expected to achieve to me is very much bound up um, in, you know, politically in what it thought it could pull off operationally. And in my view, there's no way they thought they could get over 200 hostages back in the Gaza. Um, yet they did, yeah. right? So um, that success, uh, this happened, for those interested, this happened at 9-11, where Al-Qaeda kind of overachieved by what it thought it was going to achieve. And so that can happen from time to time. And it's important to recognize that sometimes we always assume the adversary knows what they're doing. And whether it's a terrorist group or whether it's China or Russia, there's kind of a, you know, they think in thousand year increments and are perfectly strategic while we are bureaucratic and political. And whenever we get inside information or captured correspondence from a group that is um, uh, uh, more authoritarian, we find out they have politics too. Well, that leads uh, to my next question. Um, you served on the 9-11 Commission here in the United States trying to investigate um, how it is that our country failed to detect and prevent the largest terrorist attack on American soil. Um, now the largest terrorist attack on um, Israeli soil has happened, and I'm wondering whether your experience thinking about 9-11 leads you to see any parallels or lessons um, that Israel didn't learn, um, that, uh, that hopefully we learned uh, after 9-11, or any other ways that the events seem connected? So, of course, the October 7th attacks were a shock for Israel. But the idea that Hamas hates Israel and wanted to attack Israel was not a shock. I think for many Americans on September 11th, the response was, who is al-Qaeda? Like, what is this thing? Right? And it was not a household name. It was not something that most people were aware of or thought of as a significant threat. Um, so in a way, it's, in my view, a much bigger failure on the Israeli side, not just because the number of deaths relative to the size of the population is dramatically higher, uh, but because this is an adversary that they should have been prepared against. I mean, to me, it's, you know, it's more as if, if there had been um, you know, a, a series of significant al-Qaeda attacks in New York, and then a year later, there was 9-11. Um, where you would have expected better. Um, and we had dozens of operatives inside the Al-Qaeda uh, organization before the attacks too, which of course we didn't, but the Israelis did. Exactly. With Hamas. And this was, in a way, it was a brilliant intelligence success from a collection point of view. For those of you who have studied intelligence, we kind of break it up into different components. You know, the Israeli, their equivalent of the National Security Agency, uh, UNA 200, intercepted Hamas's battle plan. Right? They knew what the plan was. Um, there was tactical warning saying, hey, they're doing things that look like this plan's happening. Um, and all this was disregarded. And um, there are a number of reasons it was disregarded. There's um, part of it, um, for those of you interested, was, were gender dynamics, where a number of the people who were warning about the kind of day-to-day -day problems were uh, young female soldiers and were kind of told, you got it wrong, don't, don't pay attention. Um, but beyond that, um, if you go back to the, the second biggest Israeli intelligence failure was the 1973 war. Um, and in that war, there, was, there had been an assumption that Egypt will never attack Israel because of Israeli air supremacy. And so all the indications that Egypt might be getting ready to attack were discarded because it's not going to happen. Um, Israel has a better air force when in fact all Egypt was trying to do was a limited attack and neutralize Israel's air capacity in a certain part of the battlefield. Um, and you had a concept with Hamas as well, which was Hamas is an organization that is relatively cautious and it knows it's going to lose. And therefore it would never do something of this scale. So this plan was seen as aspirational rather than anything plausible. But once you have that concept in your mind, you tend to dismiss contrary indications. And um, you know, any of us, which is many of the people in this room who do analysis, right? one of the biggest dangers is you know, we get a hypothesis in our head and it just becomes impervious to contradictory evidence. right? It's just stuck there. And whenever we see contradictory evidence, we have an explanation for why it's wrong and we're seeking out evidence for why we're right. And that was clearly the case here. 
Um, and one of the things, ironically, that Israel put in place after the 1973 war was a red teaming concept, where you have people in the organization whose job it is to say, hey, what if we're all wrong and there's something going on differently? Um, one of the problems with red teaming is over a while you dismiss, you dismiss it because it's the red team. You're like, well, their job is to come up with contrary stuff, therefore it's not really going to happen, right? And so even this fix doesn't quite work that well um, over time. I mean, and as you said, if it's the case that even Hamas didn't expect right. Right. the attacks to succeed, right. it's hard to see how Israel would have had a, uh, that expectation, at least that they would succeed in that at this level. And that's something I should have added, and I'm sorry, thanks for the, the reminder. Um, it was a double failure from an Israeli point of view. There was an intelligence failure, uh, but there was also a tremendous military failure. Um, and uh, I think the figure, forgive me, of is um, that um, about 95% of Israel's units were away from Gaza. Most of them were either on or near the West Bank or um, in the north near Hezbollah. And as a result, when Hamas broke through, there was nothing there. And when I was in Israel in December, there was this story that, from an Israeli point of view, was a very heroic story about this former very senior general who's older than I am, who's swimming in the you know, seas in Tel Aviv, and he um, you know, hears what happens, and he kind of fights his way through and rescues his family. And in, you, know, you can imagine the Hollywood movie about that in, in the US context. But his point of view when we talked to him was, why is some old guy swimming in the sea the first person in this kibbutz, right? Where is the Israeli military? And those of you who have been to Israel, it's a tiny country, right? So going from place to place, it's not like you're deploying to a foreign country and you need lift, right? You, and there was a remarkable passivity among many uh, Israeli uh, regular military units. Uh, Hamas attacked the uh, Israeli divisional commander, command, which paralyzed much of it. So that failure... I would say is tremendously important, not just in hindsight, but I would stress that I think it explains a lot of the Israeli response today, uh, which is um, Israel, there are 100,000 Israelis who are displaced by the conflict, uh, some near Gaza, some in the north near Hezbollah. Um, and the government, to get them to return, has to be able to say they'll be safe. And it's very difficult to say, this time we'll catch it. Right? You know, last time we missed this attack that killed over 1,000 people, that led to over 200 hostages, but this time we got it. Right? How do you assure people and make them confident in security institutions? And so as a result, um, when you talk about things like deterring these groups, uh, that often involves a certain degree of risk. Right? You're saying, we think we've deterred them, but we could be wrong. And that risk tolerance has decreased dramatically, in my view, and to me, that's part of why we see Israel trying to destroy Hamas in Gaza and being much more aggressive against Hezbollah in the north is because of, um, I would say, that lack of popular trust in the security institutions. Well, that brings us to the Israeli response mm -hmm. uh, after the attacks. And for those who haven't already, I encourage you um, uh, to go to Foreign Affairs, where Dan had an article about a month ago um, critiquing the um, Israeli response. I think a lot of us are trying to understand, uh, just as I asked, what were the goals of Hamas on uh, October 7th, both their immediate military goals, what did they hope to accomplish with force, and what were their longer-term political goals. The same questions can be asked about Israel. What are its immediate military objectives in Gaza, um, and what does it see as the longer-term political goals that are achieved because of those military actions? Um, and so I'd love to hear your, your views on that and, and whether you think those goals are, are realistic or not. So uh, Israel, historically, in its, in its military doctrine and its counterterrorism policies, has tended to be a very tactically focused, um, I'll say, you know, country. And there is a sense that um, the U.S., from a counterterrorism point of view, tends to be solution-oriented. Um, and Israel has often been... How do we live with this problem in a much more manageable way? And there are, there are logics to both, and I'm happy to discuss both if people have, have questions. Uh, but in one problem Israel has had historically is thinking about political solutions. And as a result, it tended to be much more tactical. And I would critique their current operations, and there are broader questions we could have about 
uh, civilian casualties and so on. But I would say I don't think Israel actually knows what it wants in, to me, the biggest question, which is what does it want in Gaza to take over from Hamas? And I think that's a question mark. Right? And you know, in classes that I think many, the number of I see a number of uh, 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 Dartmouth faculty in this room, in, in classes that are taught on strategy, one thing we always stress is the military operations are supposed to serve a political strategy. And I think the military operations are serving military operations in Israel. And uh, the goal, as expressed by the prime minister and many other uh, senior Israelis, is to destroy Hamas. Um, I think that's not a realistic goal. Um, a very difficult goal that is more realistic to me is, can you replace Hamas as the governing entity of Gaza? And if so, who would do it? And what is required to prevent Hamas from overthrowing or undermining the governing entity? And that's a really hard question. Uh, but to me, it's a necessary one because, um, talking in circles here, forgive me. Uh, if Hamas had, um, has, let's say, 30,000 fighters, and Israel claims it's killed 10,000, Let's take that at face value. Um, let's say Israel kills 25,000 of them. Um, from an operational point of view, that's an incredible success. Uh, however, if 5,000 Hamas fighters are left in Gaza and there's nothing to oppose them, that's more than enough to take over Gaza. Right? So you need something in place. And the Biden administration, I think correctly, has pushed to have the Palestinian Authority uh, take control of Gaza. Um, I can. They're not very popular. They're not very popular, and they're less so now, right? And that there was a uh, somewhat, thankfully, from the point of view of people like me, um, there's a very good uh, pollster, um, uh, Alil Shikaki, who has done great uh, work on, on Palestinian politics, and he did a poll right before October 7th. And he found Hamas had about 30% support, which seems low, but the Palestinian Authority had about 10%. So, you know, for those of you following U.S. politics, right, the goal of President Biden or President Trump is not to necessarily have, um, you know, more than 50% support. It's to have more support than their opponent, right? And um, right now Hamas has that. So how do you restore legitimacy to the Palestinian Authority? How do you give it some degree of military capacity? To me, these are the questions, and the military operations should be serving that. Um, there are other options for Israel, but they're all pretty lousy, ranging from a permanent occupation of Gaza to simply leaving Gaza and having chaos there. Someone kind of called it like having Somalia on your doorstep. Um, there isn't much of an option for an international option. But I think, to me, this is the, the biggest question for, for Palestinians in Gaza. It's the biggest question for Israeli security is who's going to take over next. And only, only in the last few days have we seen Prime Minister Netanyahu actually put forward a few thoughts on what they might look like. And that's you know, four months into a very you know, aggressive, devastating military operation. I mean, is there any way to imagine an organization that comes to power in Gaza on the backs of this right. um, in, invasion and attack that enjoys any kind of support among the Palestinian people there? Right. I mean, I, there's a question of what, what people have talked about is, could you have apolitical technocrats you know, doing things like turning the water back on? Right. Um, one huge problem in Gaza right now is actually crime. Um, this is in a way to be expected, right? which is, it's happened in Iraq, for those of you who are interested in 2003, which is as soon as the government disappears and you know, conditions in Gaza are desperate, right? uh, you, have, you have crime. And Gaza had crime before you know, October 7th, right? but you had, a, you had a real police force. Now you don't. And so very basic law and order functions. Uh, if you want to distribute humanitarian aid, um, humanitarian aid is a form of currency, right? People want food, they want medicine, and if you control it, you control power and you control, you can sell it. Um, so you need these basic services, but yes, any government put, Israel puts in, by definition, will have severe legitimacy issues. Um, so the hope would be that you have some degree of kind of, whether international or Arab, um, support for some sort of government of technocratic government that allows a transition. Uh, but that's really easy to say, right? And in practice, exceptionally difficult. And any government needs a course of capacity. Um, a question mark, there, you know, there are a lot of question marks in my talk today. Let me add another one. Um, a question mark is what would Hamas's attitude be 
toward a technocratic government. Um, Hamas is sensitive to public opinion, and we don't have good information on Gaza right now, but um, the sense is that Hamas is much less popular now in Gaza than it is in the West Bank. And that makes sense, if you will. Many Palestinians in Gaza are, of course, furious at Israel for the devastation, but they're also angry at Hamas. Right? Um, you know, Israel's response to me is utterly foreseeable. Right? If you know, the figure um, in the United States relative to population it, you know, would be about 30,000 Americans, I think, if I, I did the math once and forgot. So let's, let's go with a large number. Um, if you had um, that sort of death toll happening from Mexico or Canada, you know, what would the United States do, right? The United States would you know, have a very aggressive military operation there, so there's no surprise. And in fact, Hamas probably wanted some sort of operation response to, again, burnish its resistance credentials. Um, so would Hamas allow some degree of technocratic government? And the answer might be yes, um, at least for the short term, but it also might be no. I think it's a genuine unknown. I mean, one point, uh, a point that you made in your foreign affairs article is that in some ways these military objectives and the longer term political objectives that you just described mm -hmm. may be at counter purposes. Right. Um, you said that in order to install or help support some other organization besides Hamas in Gaza, there would need to be support of entities outside right. of Gaza, uh, particularly other Arab right. uh, countries. And given the way Israel has been conducting this war with the high level of right. civilian fatalities and the right. seeming disregard for mm -hmm. um, civilians, uh, it seems like uh, that's making that less and less likely every day the war goes on. Yeah, they, so the Arab states are interesting. I want to make two points on this. Uh, so on the one hand, you know, Hamas is a uh, Muslim Brotherhood organization supported by Iran, right? That's the worst nightmare of many Arab states. Right, so they are privately delighted if Hamas is destroyed, but the Arab um, people stand strongly behind the Palestinians. So you have regimes that are very nervous about their own people and their own legitimacy if they're seen as in some way supporting um, what, Israel's, uh, what Israel's doing. So I think there's, they're willing to forgive a lot if... Um, uh, if Israel is willing to um, kind of make enough concessions where they can say to their own people, we're making progress. Uh, but where I think it's in a way actually harder for Israel um, is in the West Bank. Because in order to improve the legitimacy of the Palestinian Authority, you would actually have to change policy in the West Bank. And that's where the Palestinian Authority governs. That's where it has its greatest presence. And Israel's policy uh, since October 7th has been much more aggressive. But even putting that aside, you have a government in place in Israel that is, you know, parts of the government are convinced that that is rightfully Jewish land and are uh, greatly expanding the Jewish presence in the West Bank. Um, and there is an arming of the settler community. There are a lot of things that kind of bode poorly for the future. And you want that to be going in the opposite direction, but, it, but it's yeah. not. That brings us to another question, um, which has to do with the regional dynamics of the war. Um, I noticed one thing you hadn't mentioned um, about Hamas's aims in the attacks of October 7th, although it's one I've seen others speculate on, is the possibility that they intended to incite some um, larger conflict um, in the region, at a minimum with Lebanon, but possibly mm -hmm. um, even broader with Syria, Yemen, as we now see um, going on. And uh, that really is, I think, a, you know, a further ex escalation. That's kind of the nightmare scenario where this tragedy that up until now has been confined to a, a fairly small piece of land spreads to um, the surrounding uh, countries. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, we've already seen some escalation, I think, um, unquestionably. Um, but uh, not uh, the nightmare scenario yet of kind of full-scale war uh, on all Israel's borders, what do you think the chances are uh, that we'll manage to keep a lid on it? Uh, so one thing that it seems like Hamas expected was that Hezbollah would join in and were, um, did not inform Hezbollah of the attacks, but were genuinely disappointed when Hezbollah did a more limited response. Now, Hezbollah is, I am fascinated by Hezbollah. It's, uh, its own response has been to show solidarity with Hamas but avoid things boiling over. So it's done very limited attacks on Israel. When I was in Israel, 
in the north, um, you know, there's there's Hezbollah attacks every day, and I asked, you know, it's going you know right on the border. How concerned should I be? And they're like, oh, you're in a civilian vehicle. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine, right? And so it shows Hezbollah was very much trying to you know go after certain targets, but not others. Um, where Hezbollah has the capacity to strike all of Israel with a massive rocket arsenal, and hasn't done so. Um, and so Hezbollah has been careful, but there are some reasons to be scared, right? So reason one, uh, this thing almost became a regional war on day two. Um, Israel, the Wall Street Journal reported Israel had um, intelligence that turned out to be faulty, that Hezbollah was about to attack. Um, I know that a number of people are very critical of the Biden administration. One thing I give them tremendous credit for is talking Israel off the ledge and saying, we think that information's bad, here's why, and don't do this attack, right? Don't do a regional war. And at the same time, by deploying a second aircraft carrier, trying to say, and by the way, we're here if things get rougher, right? And to me, that was a big success in preventing something that could have been much worse. Um, but when you have you know, um, anti-tank uh, guns being fired into Israel every day, when you have Israeli responses, they just killed a senior Hezbollah commander today, actually. Um, those things can easily escalate, right? It's, it's not always controllable. And to say, well, there's you know, rationality on both sides, I actually believe that. Um, one thing I would stress is, uh, for those of you who have followed Lebanon, um, you know that uh, Lebanon has imploded in the last five years. It's gone from a middle-income country to a poor country. Um, its currency has collapsed. Um, its banking system has collapsed. And Hezbollah does not want to be responsible for you know, pulling the last Jenga piece out of the Lebanese tower. right? So there's, there are strong disincentives. Um, but the back and forth to me is a very dangerous one um, and one I'm, I'm tremendously concerned about. I'm, other thing I would add going back to this question of Israeli risk tolerance is if Israeli security leaders are asking themselves, um, are we eventually going to fight a war with Hezbollah? And if the answer is yes, maybe we should do it tomorrow. Right? That way we won't be surprised. You'll be on our terms. Um, and so there's a real possibility of preventive war on the Israeli side. Um, I would put the odds at about one in four. Um, that might seem low, but that should be a very scary number. Um, to be clear, those odds are utterly arbitrary, right? Like people like me discuss that, and some are higher and some are lower. But um, to me, it's, it's a real possibility um, given how Israel now sees its security situation, which is much more sensitive to the potential that, that deterrence won't work. Last question um, that I have for you is uh, the obvious one after this conversation, and that is the, about the future. Uh, and there I'm curious really about two things. Uh, one, the, the more short-term uh, future, and one, the more long-term future. Um, you know, how do we uh, bring the fighting to an end? How does that happen? What stories can we tell ourselves about um, how someday the, the bullets stop firing and the bombs stop uh, dropping? And then, again, this longer question about um, how do we make sure that they don't just start firing again a few weeks later? And in particular, I mean, we're here in Hanover in the United States. Uh, I'm curious about what role you think the United States has to play, if any, in that process in getting us more quickly to ceasefire and then uh, in the longer term to some kind of uh, durable settlement um, that means that both Israelis and Palestinians don't have to be looking over their shoulder every morning when they get out of bed worrying that this tragedy is going to happen again. So one thing that is being discussed right now is a ceasefire. And from an Israeli point of view, there are two imperatives happening right now. And we haven't talked that much about the hostages. But um, Hamas holds 130 Israelis as hostages. Probably at least 30 are dead. I would actually guess far more. But a significant number are dead. Uh, but that's still a large number. And at the same time, Israel wants to destroy Hamas. And when you are bombing Hamas strongholds, where Hamas leaders are, where Hamas infrastructure um, is, that's probably where hostages are as well. Um, it's very hard uh, to do uh, aggressive military operations at no risk to hostages. So um, there is a tremendous debate in Israel 
uh, among very, very serious security types over should the priority be the hostages or destroying Hamas. And the coalition government, the right wing of it is more about destroying Hamas, and that's politically more powerful right now. But it's, it could go either way, and I think Netanyahu's in the middle. So there is a chance relatively soon there could be a ceasefire, but there may not be, right? I, I could have said that to you two weeks ago, too. Um, so the hostage issue may result in a ceasefire. Um, I personally think we can discuss the efficacy of Israel's attempts to destroy Hamas, but I think in any event, it's had diminishing returns from a military point of view. That if you kill 12,000 versus 10,000, I don't think that matters much in terms of the broader political effects you're trying to achieve in Gaza. Um, so I'm, I'm, I question whether sustained operations offer Israel that much, uh, again, purely from a kind of operational point of view. And meanwhile, they continue to accrue these costs. Exactly. Um, not only the cost to the uh, Palestinian people themselves, of course, but the broader context right. in which Israel has to operate. And this is something, so we talk about kind of ending it. My sense is it begins with a ceasefire over hostages and continues, right? Now, from a Hamas point of view, there's no incentive to let that last hostage go, right? They have to worry that, um, you know, the moment they do, Israel's going to say, okay, you know, no reason to hold back now. Um, But that said, you know, the hope in some ways is you go from a short-term pause to a medium-term pause and you build other things around it. Um, And part of that would be a different government in Gaza, right? And to me, that's a very legitimate request on the Israeli side, right? Which is you have this government that launched this very brutal attack and uh, regime change to me does make sense from an Israeli point of view. I think it's a very hard goal and maybe unrealistic, but it's not a wrong goal. And so uh, can you explore options that at least dilute Hamas's power um, in Gaza would be uh, one thing. Uh, the U.S. role, uh, so there's a question, and um, I won't say his name because I ask, he hasn't auth- uh, authorized me to do it, but I have a Palestinian friend who is extremely skeptical of this approach, which is the U.S. approach, um, the Biden administration approach is what they call the bear hug approach, right? which is you, you kind of put your arms around Israel and you say, we're here for you. And by making Israel feel secure, it actually enables Israel to make concessions, right? You're assuring its security. You're assuring that it's not alone. Um, and there's a legitimate question of, does it actually work, right? Or is it, they say, okay, we feel secure. Now we don't have to worry about making concessions, right? And um, the Biden administration would say whether it's not attacking Hezbollah, right? Um, this isn't much consolation to Palestinians in Gaza, but the number of Palestinians who, uh, who have died has um, declined uh, from a week by week, week basis has actually declined pretty substantially from the first few weeks of the war. So the pace of operations um, in terms of the death toll has declined. And they would say, look, there's progress. Um, I think the U.S. actually could be doing a lot more. On the humanitarian aid side, there's a lot that is knocking into Gaza, and much of that is because of bad Israeli policies. Right? Um, there's a lot more. Uh, it's hard once it's in Gaza, though. Again, you have this crime problem. You don't have an infrastructure for distribution in Gaza. So there are problems on the Gaza side, but there are also a lot more that can, a lot more that can be done on the Israeli side. Um, and I think uh, the United States should be pushing very hard for the ceasefire. Um, I don't think it's good for Israel to continue, and it's certainly not good for uh, the Palestinians in Gaza. All right, I think that gives us a lot to talk about. And so uh, now I want to open it up to... Uh, your questions and Dan's uh, answers. Please just raise your hand if you'd like to be recognized. Uh, As most of you know, we try first to go um, with our students. And uh, when we've got some student questions, then we can um, open it up to others. So we have uh, two folks up here. Hi, thank you for tonight. Uh, One of the questions that I have. I I apologize. Would you mind saying your name? Oh, sorry. My name is Ayman Salha. I'm a 26 sophomore. Mm -hmm. Uh, The question that I had for you is, you talked about a regime change um, in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think the likeliness of possibly, let's say, like the the Arab League stepping in and putting in like an uh, intermediate like government for the time Mm -hmm. being, if not for a long term solution, at least for a short term to study everything right now? Like what could they be playing a bigger role? 
If so, what's stopping them? Is it maybe normalization with Israel, like kind of worries of that from other Arab nations? Um, and how, how would that approach uh, work if it would? Uh, so I think um, from a U.S. point of view, having a greater Arab League presence would be fantastic. Um, there are several reasons why I think it's unlikely. Uh, first, going back to the legitimacy question, where I think they would feel they, have, they were aiding an Israeli occupation of Gaza. Right? And that's something they don't want to touch. Um, in general, the Palestinian issue has been bad politics for many Arab regimes, where they're often criticized for not doing enough by their own people. And strangely enough, kind of the more you do, the more it's easier to criticize you. Um, and um, so this way they can just say, you know, we will never join in supporting the Israeli occupation and you know, be very steadfast, which doesn't help ordinary Palestinians in Gaza, right? Um, they also lack a military capacity, right? They certainly would not want to be the ones shooting at Hamas to prevent um, any sort of insurrection. Um, and so that would still require somewhere else. Um, my hope, though, would be that the Arab League might bless something, right? That they could give political legitimacy to whoever comes in. Because I do think they have a role to play, and I do think, you know, certainly more legitimacy than the United States or Israel uh, for the audiences in Gaza. Um, hey, my name is Ahmed. I'm a freshman here at Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually have two questions, but like the same topic. First, for Professor Valentino, um, I'd like to rephrase your last question, which is basically about the future of what's going on after um, the current war. Um, I would like actually to phrase it as, uh, what should be done from both sides to stop the planes that goes over Gaza daily, thinking it was like strikes coming on, because as you all know, the planes going on over Gaza is not only a case of about war, but it's actually going on um, more like scouting missions daily. Mm -hmm. and, and also, um, Professor Bayman, I appreciate your opinion about actually Hamas returning the hostages. I definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. But also, I think we should be also focusing on what should be done from the Israeli side as well. Mm -hmm. As you might know, of course, uh, all the uh, prisoners in, in the Israeli side from Palestinians that are being held in administrative jails, mm -hmm. basically being held with no case, and they're not being like, allowed to have like lawyers to, uh, to stand for them. Uh, I think, yeah, Hamas should return the hostages and everything should be done, but also... Um, I think I'd appreciate your take on what Israel should be doing as well from their side as well because it's, it's not like Hamas think that's going on but also like a bunch of violations we got on from the Israeli side as well. Mm -hmm. um, great questions. And, and I apologize. I want to um, use your question to actually answer part of what Professor Valentino asked at the end about the long term, which I, I didn't fully answer. Um, so let me start with that and then go to your questions if you don't mind. Um, so I, I'm probably the last, you know, person in Washington who still has hope for some sort of broader peace process in the long term. Um, and that's in part because I think there's no other reasonable alternative. I can, I can criticize every approach, but I would criticize the alternatives to a peace process more strongly. Um, President Clinton in 1993, when things were beginning, when there was a time of hope, um, he talked about the, the quiet miracle of a normal life, right? And I think that's what Israelis and Palestinians desperately want, right, is just not to have this conflict hanging over them um, as a constant basis. Um, and so to, to get to your more immediate questions, um, there is certainly, in my view, always going to be Israeli surveillance over Gaza for the next, I'm making this number up, but 20 years, and then add more if conflict continues, right? Where is, from Israel's point of view, this is a dangerous area. They've they failed by not detecting October 7th, and they're going to have constant surveillance. Now, how surveillance happens is going to change just because technology changes, right? And you'll see you know, drones, and you'll see um, a, a wide variety of things. Um, and you know, the hope would be as you move towards a ceasefire, you wouldn't have strikes coming from that surveillance. But you would still see, I, in my view, is likely to see a number of Israeli strikes, again, because they're going to be very risk averse. And the question in the past would be, we see something we're not sure of, make sure we're sure before we attack. Now it's, we see something we're not sure of, let's attack because who knows what could happen. And so I think that's going to be much more likely and that's gonna be one of the longer term legacies um, of October 7th. Um, on your question on uh, prisoners, uh, for those who haven't followed, uh, one thing Israel has done since October 7th is actually um, detained a lot of Palestinians in the West Bank um, who have, um, 
you know, there's a lot going on in the West Bank that's its own conversation, and often with very limited legal support, in some cases, no legal procedures. Um, and so part of that is a capacity issue, right? And, but to me, that is something that um, it's perfectly reasonable to say that Israel should be doing a much better job to try to, you know, first of all, have trials to try to process people quickly, determine who are the people who are actually problem people and who are the people who are just caught up in this. So there's a lot there. Please go ahead. Yeah, can you talk about things that happened before October 7th? I just said, can you talk about all the detainees happening before October 7th? Oh, sure. Um, so it's been, it's increased before, um, after October 7th, but um, th- this is a broader West Bank question, right? So this wasn't, um, most of this wasn't really about Hamas and Gaza. But uh, you have two entities in the West Bank uh, that were kind of both detaining people. You had the Palestinian Authority and you had uh, Israel. And the Palestinian Authority did the bulk of it. And they both shared their kind of violently anti-Hamas views, right? So they both wanted to stop Hamas. And from Palestinian Authority, it's a political threat. So uh, they were always very eager to work with Israel on detention. Right, and some of those who go to Israeli jails, some of those who go to Palestinian jails. Um, somewhat tragically, the Palestinian jails were much harsher on the Palestinians than the Israeli jails were. But not that the Israeli jails were super gentle, but uh, better. So you had a lot of detention going on um, in there and um, at a very large scale. Um, so I'm not quite sure what else to say other than that. But that I mean, do you that think we, that part of the negotiations could include Right. Um, better facilities for um, prisoners on both sides, um, both, both pal- in the Palestinian uh, mm-hmm. territories and in the Israeli jails, and um, and a greater commitment of resources to the legal process so that people uh, do have more speedy access to representation. And um, I think that's um, certainly a reasonable goal. I, I think they'd be fairly down, far down on the list of yeah. what they would do, but yeah, I think it's a reasonable goal. Thank you both for coming in. I wanted to ask specifically on a possible peace process. And so throughout this, uh, the history of this conflict between Israel and Palestine, we've often seen in negotiations when they occur, the United States facilitating these negotiations, particularly in the 1990s. But I wanted to ask more increasingly as American uh, prestige in the Middle East has declined very rapidly is there a role to play for other non-American states uh, in negotiations? And to what extent do you think American involvement is productive or counterproductive? Um, so there aren't many countries that want to take this one on, <laughs> right? It's kind of a loser issue, right? Um, and you've seen shifts in Israel. It was really the second intifada was probably the turning point where the country became more right-leaning and up. Uh, for those of you who follow Israel um, or don't follow Israel, it's, uh, it's one of the few countries where right and left are defined by, by security issues, right? So you could, be, you could be a socialist and be right wing if you're conservative on the Palestinian issue, right? It's a, it's a different sort of logic than the US. Um, the country in the second intifada turned right, and there, the, the narrative, and I'm happy to discuss this at length, the narrative on the Israeli side was we made a serious offer for peace and we got bullets in response. So why bother? Right? So there was a strong sense that the Second Intifada was a turning point, and there hasn't been strong interest in the Israeli side on a serious peace process. <clears throat> on the Palestinian side, you have Mahmoud Abbas, who I think actually would have been happy to kind of go down the peace route, but you had a divided uh, Palestinian entity. You had Gaza and, um, and the West Bank with two different governments, and they were always trying to undermine each other. It was very hard to have kind of sustained negotiations. Uh, we now know, which is troubling to me, that you know, one of Netanyahu's pitches was in order to make sure we don't have negotiations with the West Bank, let's have a strong Hamas. Right? So part of what he was doing was trying to encourage aid from uh, Qatar and other places in order to keep Hamas viable, in order to keep Palestinians divided. Right? And that, that makes sense. Right? That's a logical political strategy if your goal is to disrupt, to prevent a, a serious peace effort. Um, and so I, th- I think you know, if others want to go for it, I, as someone who's you know, proud of his country, I'd be delighted if you know, there were a you know, Norwegian or, for that matter, Chinese peace process. Right? If it worked, it worked. Uh, but I think the U.S. is still better positioned. Um, it's the country that has the most trust of Israel. Um, and Israel is the dominant power. I mean, one thing that 
is hard to kind of think about in this context, but I think it's a very important part is the power differential. Right? And so when you're trying to talk about uh, who makes what concessions, it's not two relatively evenly matched countries negotiating a border, right? It's a very powerful entity and a relatively weak one. And so the key factor is working with Israel. And then there are, the United States also has influence with Arab states that are willing to support um, uh, whatever the Palestinian entity is going to be. So I still think the US is best positioned for that. Um, but one lesson that um, uh, President Obama came into office in uh, 2009 and thought, yeah, this one's easy. And like a year later was like, we're done, right? Like we're, we're not, this is not happening. We're not going down this road. There were efforts by Secretary of State uh, Kerry later on, but never taken that seriously. President Trump very much did not see that as his role. Like was very much uh, trying to support Israel and not thinking of trying to be the one bringing peace. And President Biden wanted to focus on uh, China particularly, and then China and Ukraine. So really since I would say around 2010, there hasn't been strong US focus on the Middle East in general. Um, but especially the sense that you know, the US cannot really bring peace to Israel-Palestine. Um, if we're grabbing for silver linings, one silver lining of October 7th may be that the United States may be more willing to kind of engage in a peace process um, in the region, and that, that is my hope. Uh, but there's a lot. There's a long way to go. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Josh. I'm a 25. Um, where do you where do you see? So Russia's support of Israel and their relationship has been complex. They try to play sort of Iran and Syria off of each other. Um, but more recently, they've taken more of a pro Hamas stance. Where do you think the Russia Israel relationship goes from here? And how do you think Israel will handle its relationship with Russia vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? So one of the dynamics driving the relationship from an Israeli point of view is that Russia has a significant presence next door in Syria. And Israel wants the ability to do strikes in Syria, especially against Hezbollah assets there. And to do so means dealing with Russian air defenses. And <clears throat> there has been a kind of um, understanding that Russia will allow some Israeli activity uh, and Israel has, um, before October 7th with Ukraine, Israel's view was notionally we support uh, Ukraine and the United States, but we don't want to annoy Russia because Russia is next door to us. And that's especially so because the question of will the United States be committed to the Middle East is an open question. And you know, it's kind of real politique at its, at its, you know, at its clearest. Um, with Russia being more open in its support for Iran in particular, um, Israel is reconsidering that. But that's still a question mark because Israel is very worried about Hezbollah and very worried about the Syrian general. So I don't think Israeli policy is going to change dramatically. Um, but uh, the question to me is in some ways, will Russia policy change more dramatically? Will it go more beyond rhetoric? But from a, a question of munitions and arming groups, Russia needs every weapon it has right now. So I think that's a longer term question, not a short term question. Hi, I'm Jonah. I'm in the class of 27. Um, something I'm really curious about is how you think changes in government administration of both Israel and the US could affect potential outcomes for resolving the conflict, especially since um, on both sides, both countries have very much can change an approach to international and national and like kind of peace process policies between separate administrations. Yeah, our domestic politics in both uh, countries are going to play a big part in the realm of the possible here. So, uh, absolutely. So there's you know in the U.S. side, as I think everyone here knows, a lot will depend on who is president of the United States in in nine months. Um, Traditionally, second-term administrations in the United States pay more attention to foreign policy, uh, and that's in part because their domestic agendas tend to stall out, and in addition, the uh, president has more freedom of maneuver, they're thinking more about legacy, um, and also in an Israel sense, uh, a president is more willing to burn political capital. There's no election on the horizon that they're concerned about. So I could see a Biden administration being more aggressive pushing a peace process. 
Um, a Trump administration has been always been openly clear. It sees itself um, entirely as a supporter of Israel. And you had a U.S. ambassador in Israel whose view was, hey, there's stuff Israel is not doing that it should be doing, right? Whether that's on the West Bank and being more aggressive there. Um, you know, the whole push to move the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem was really an American politics thing. It was not an Israeli thing. Um, it was something that a very small number of Israelis cared about. Um, and that was done under Trump administration. So I think there'd be very little appetite in a Trump administration to pursue anything that required Israel to make concessions. Um, Israeli politics are, are fascinating, right? And largely unpredictable. Um, so I'm going to make some statements, but take these with many grains of salt. It's a, um, <clears throat> the coalition system there is, is a very dysfunctional coalition system. Um, so you have two different dynamics going on. Uh, one is the people who right now would, if it were just a popularity contest, would be most likely to be prime minister, um, are people who, um, first of all, are largely calling for a ceasefire, not out of humanitarian grounds, but in a get our prisoners back sense. Um, and from a U.S. point of view, are more willing to kind of work with the United States as more similar views on the Palestinian Authority and are less conservative um, than the Netanyahu government. However, um, I mentioned that during the Second Intifada, the lesson was um, for Israel was we offered concessions and we got violence. Um, multiply that by 10 for October 7th. And I think the uh, more far right in Israel, which did pretty well in the last election, is going to do even better in the next. That there'll be a significant constituency that says, you know, we just can't have Arabs around. Right? And that's tougher policies on the West Bank, within Israel itself, and there are a lot of different possibilities. But I could imagine a situation where, um, you know, one is from a U.S. point of view, a better scenario, where a more uh, government comes in more willing to work with the United States. But the other is that the more extreme right grows stronger in Israel, um, and both those are possible. And it's hard to predict the specifics of the election. I mean, Netanyahu's deeply unpopular right, right now in Israel. Right. No, uh, yeah, I, I'm even, assuming even more so right. because he's seen as having failed to prevent. Um, these attacks and uh, responded ineptly right. um, once they happened. Right. Civil society had to um, take matters into their own hands for weeks um, in responding. So he, he, he personally uh, seems like he's quite wounded. I, I would think he's not going to be prime minister, uh, but Israel doesn't have to have an election for quite some time, right? There's no, he has a stable coalition, so there's no forcing function. Um, right now, but yes, I think he is um, likely to have his political career ended. However, he's a remarkable politician, right? And he's someone who's come back again and again. So to say glibly, he'll never survive this, right? It kind of ignores the history of, you know, in the 1990s, right, he was there, right? So he's someone who really, you know, he's the longest serving prime minister in Israeli history, and there's a reason for that. Who's next? Go ahead, Lillian. Um, this is a little bit maybe outside the exact Israel-Palestine question, but as we're talking about the United States, something that I've been sort of curious about in this question of escalation is like, um, like with the Houthis in Yemen and stuff like that and the U.S. response to attacks on ships in the Red Sea and like how that might escalate and sort of how that's going to be managed, but also sort of the long-term consequences of I think freedom of navigation has been something that's like a big stick the United States likes to wave, but there's been surprisingly little support for this specific freedom of navigation operation, because I think there are concerns about escalation and just some of the implications of that. Right. So the U.S. would say, you know, look, we have put together a coalition, and the task force is multinational. Um, the problem with uh, trying to coerce the Houthis is uh, either option doesn't work, right? So the Biden administration largely tried ignoring them for several months and just defensively shooting down missiles. And that didn't work. The missiles kept coming. And then it tried to attack Houthis, uh, whether rocket and missile sites and personnel. And it's a relatively small amount of pain for an organization that's been through a very brutal civil war. And so that limited amount of pain didn't work. Uh, so you don't really have a good answer to how to stop these Houthi attacks. Um, the hope would be if there ever is a ceasefire, 
that the Houthis would not be saying, we're going to keep fighting even though the Palestinians themselves are not. Um, so that would be, the, I think, the most likely way. But I think you're kind of stuck with a low-level conflict here. But the good news is I think the Houthi one in particular, it's harder for that one to escalate. Like I don't quite know how it would escalate in a practical sense. I can, I can play out a few scenarios, but that's very different than um, in Lebanon where I can easily imagine a much more aggressive uh, set of scenarios. Jonathan? Yes, yeah, so you mentioned the... Hold on. Oh, sorry, thank you. Sorry, internets. All right, so you mentioned that you favor a, a ceasefire. Right. And you've also mentioned that they maybe killed 10,000, 20,000 or left. In terms of the, the leadership, mm -hmm. how much of the leadership do you think is left? Because what I'm, what I'm trying to understand is right. if you leave intact their ability to make future attacks... Right. How have we solved this problem? Right. I mean, so there's a. Let me ask, let me answer your second statement and then answer your specific question. So, um, if Israel had taken the intelligence warning seriously and put a few Apache helicopters on the border, the attackers would be dead. Right? It, it, was, it was an operation that required surprise to succeed. It wasn't the sort of thing that. Um, I think Hamas could necessarily do again if Israel is prepared to respond uh, uh, promptly. And this again goes to the risk tolerance question, right? Where I think Israel will be responding very aggressively, but in part for exactly that reason. Um, so to kind of go to the question of how intact is their capability, probably reasonably intact. Now, there are different ways to measure this, right? So one is, you know, number of dead people. Um, another is thinking about senior leadership, and uh, the most wanted from an Israeli point of view are still alive. Um, Yahya Sinwar, um, Hadith, right? There are a few people who are still alive. Um, and then uh, one thing the Israel found in the Second Intifada, the United States found in Iraq in the late 2000s, was a lot of your most oper um, effective operations are actually when you go after mid-level people. So let me give my Dartmouth example without trying to... Um, uh, uh, talk about college I don't know that well, but like, I suspect, God forbid, that Dartmouth could survive if its president were not here, right? And probably could survive without the president and a few deans. Uh, what if the computer tech isn't here, right? What if the whole uh, uh, Wi-Fi goes down, right? What if there is a problem with housing, right? And that, that kind of day-to-day -day logistics is tremendously important, and there aren't that many skilled people who can do that, right? It's not like, okay, there's another person who can just take over the computer system, right? Like, no, you actually need a fair amount of knowledge to do that. And so how many of those people in the middle have been taken out? I don't know. Um, I suspect a fair number, but again, Hamas has a lot of capacity. It ran a state, right? This is not a small group. But when we talk about Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda is a tiny group. Um, Hamas is, is huge. Um, and that's just, we, you know, we talk about the 25 to 30,000 number. That's fighters, right? There are tons of civil servants. Um, so Hamas has a lot of capacity. I think it's going to be you know, very hard to disrupt that capacity. So to me, it's a much more aggressive Israeli response. And also, Israel will deploy more troops at or near the border. One change you're likely to see in Israel that's already being discussed is um, mobilizing the reserves for longer periods of time. So you'll simply have more military forces. And you know, whether, again, it, you know, Israel responded promptly or if there had simply been a few, um, really, battalions that had been closer to the border it would have been a very different result. So to me, that's will be some of the Israeli answer. So Phil. Dan, so I have a question, Phil Hahn here. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this has to do with the airstrikes. Mm -hmm. So it's been really opaque, as far as I'm concerned, about how Israel is doing airstrikes. Right. But if you go back, let's say to the second Lebanon war, and, Hezbollah, and Israel began to do these strikes where they targeted Hezbollah infrastructure, but tried relatively to minimize the number of civilian casualties right. compared to what they could have. And then that traveled on to Hamas and a number of crises, um, uh, 2009, 12, 14, mm -hmm. right. where it didn't seem to work to, to deter the way that it did against Hezbo Hezbollah. Can, can you give any insight in terms of, uh, you talked about deterrence failure. Did, first, did, did Israel believe that it could not deter the way that it had in the past? through punishing airstrikes? And second, any insight into how the air campaign has differed from the way that Israel has attacked 
Hamas in the past, recent past? So I think Israel would have said on October 6th, uh, deterrence is working, and we're using airstrikes properly, right? You know, which is when Hamas does a rocket attack, we attack their rocket facilities, and we attack what they would say is you know, critical military infrastructure, right? But they um, blow some stuff up, and Hamas doesn't like that and causes um, anger among Palestinian civilians, and that causes Hamas to stop. So I think they would have said it's working, and then obviously it did not work, right? It was, that was an incorrect judgment. Um, and now it's to me, uh, we haven't really talked about the, the kind of basic military uh, question of you know, exceptionally difficult uh, operating environment. Right? So uh, cities are always the ultimate nightmare for any military, and there are plenty of reasons I'm happy to discuss. Um, on top of that, in many conflicts uh, like Ukraine, you would expect civilians to flee, right? But in Gaza, they are certainly trying to, right? But there's no, there's no escape hatch, right? There's no place they are not going to Egypt. So you have civilians who are in the midst of the conflict, in part because they can't flee, and in part because um, Hamas wants them there, right? So there are benefits to Hamas for that. Um, you also have Hamas tremendously prepared for this conflict with this, you know, uh, we, those of us who followed the conflict knew Hamas had a tunnel infrastructure, but everyone's been surprised by the scale of it, right? Just how massive it is. Um, so the military questions are exceptionally difficult ones. Um, and to destroy that um, is going to involve a lot of dead civilians, right? And so the question is always ratios. Right? And as you know, better than I, I think, you know, one of the big questions on this is how do you think about proportionality? Right? And proportionality, when we talk about war, is not about proportionality between the two sides in terms of dead. It's in terms of in proportion to the, um, the military value of the target. And how do you judge that question? And Israel, to me, has clearly said the mid-level Hamas commander, who in the past we would have been much more careful about civilian casualties, now we're going to be much more aggressive about that. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Sophia. I'm a 23. Um, we spoke a little bit about the role of domestic politics in Israel, and I've had a professor suggest like an improbable but kind of like ideal coalition between um, Arab Israelis and the descendants of like the original like settlers of Israel like, in mm -hmm. the kibbutzes. Um, and I'm wondering, as you've been looking <coughs> at the conflict, what you've observed as the current approach um, of the Arab Israeli community um, and their potential role going forward um, in shaping narratives within Israel. And then in addition, um, going for like on the other side of the Israeli institutional view, like to what degree does Israel see this community as an important um, like source of international legitimacy as like in the US, Israel is kind of touted as like the only democracy in the Middle East? So this is, uh, there's a lot in this, right? So um, after October 7th, one of the surprises to many Israeli Jews were um, how critical that the Israeli Arab community was of Hamas, right? And openly rallying on the side of, of the kind of you know, broader Israeli um, identity. And that was, a, that was a surprise to a lot of Israeli Jews. Um, but Israel's policies towards the Israeli Arabs, um, it's you know, more accepting than in the past but has been quite discriminatory, right? And so there are, part of it is, what does it mean to be an Israeli, right? A lot of it is tied up in the identity of it's a Jewish state, which uh, for, uh, when we're talking about Israeli Arabs, we're mainly talking about um, Christians and Muslims, primarily Muslims. And so there's a question of separation from the very identity of the state. Um, some things like military service is something that's tied to benefits. So if you can't do military service, sometimes there are benefit uh, disadvantages as well. Um, and then there are questions of, that are kind of more broadly about who is the state for. Um, and, but you also have a number of political parties that are very you know, openly anti-Israeli Arab, right? that are Jewish nationalist in the sense of this is a state for Jews, and therefore there is a presence in Israeli society that doesn't belong there. And so there's a lot of different things going on there. And it's something that I'm actually I'm personally very interested in that question because um, the Israeli Arab population, I, I should have begun with an explanation for those who don't follow it closely. Um, this is referring to the population uh, within Israel's 67 borders. And that's about 20% of that is Arab. 
right? And so you have a very large population um, that is um, somewhat separate from the main identity of the Israeli body politic. And the question of, you know, early on it was seen as a, a potentially subversive threat. And now it's a broader question of how do you integrate this community? And there's a big debate about whether it should be done. And if so, do you give um, additional social support? Because it tends to be, uh, there's uh, educational issues and housing issues. Um, so a, a wide variety of problems. There's a question back up here. Yep, Melissa. Um, thank you for coming. I'm uh, Melissa Herman. I'm on the faculty. I. Um, it seems to me that around the world, almost everybody is despondent about this situation and that we all feel like we have no, no influence, no way to do anything about this. Um, can you offer us any thoughts about that? We're, we're trying. What, we, right. what can we do? I, I mean, I, I don't have an answer that I think people here you know, are not aware of, but I urge everyone to be politically active um, in their own community and then more broadly in their own country. Right and you know on whatever issues you care about, right? That's that's one of the, the joys and rewards of democracy. But it does matter, right? And President Biden right now is responding to criticism within the Democratic Party that he is too supportive of Israel, right? So whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, the domestic politics really matters, right? And so uh, and how other countries are responding is shaped by their domestic politics. There's a lot more going on. Right? And one could talk about strategic concerns, one could talk about particular interest groups, there are a host of different factors. But citizens organizing and expressing voice does matter. It's, it's ineffable, it often fails, right? I mean, there are a host of problems, but, but engagement, I think, uh, you know, let me put it this way, the Biden White House is very aware that there are discussions going on in places like Hanover, New Hampshire, about one part of its foreign policy in a way that it probably isn't about Brazil. Right or Japan, right, and you know some important countries, but it is aware that there's a different uh, uh, dialogue going on on this. Thank you. Um, my name's Ellie. I'm visiting Dartmouth at the moment, but I'm a third year student at Oxford. Um, I think so. I was thinking you said earlier that we always assume that the adversary knows what they're doing, and that maybe in this case Hamas kind of overachieved. And I was thinking. Um, or wondering how much you think that the timings of these attacks were motivated by kind of imploding Israeli politics before the October, um, before the attacks um, to do with protests and the judicial reforms. And if you think that the sort of resurgence in protests that we've seen over the weekend in places like Tel Aviv and Beersheba, if those could possibly kind of distract, especially Netanyahu's government who's looking to stay in power, distract them from the situation and encourage bodies like Hezbollah to of attack more seriously from the north? Uh, so I think the political divisions within Israel certainly were encouraging to Hamas, but I don't think they mattered that much for the October 7th attacks. Uh, uh, part of it is we have this, this plan for the operation that was hatched several years before, so it was before the protests. So they were at least thinking about this very seriously. Um, I tend to think that from Hamas's point of view, every day they waited was another day it might be discovered and that Israel might respond. So there was, there was an organizational and operational logic to doing it now rather than tomorrow. So I think they kind of lined it up, got it ready, and launched it. There is a question, having said that, one thing I'm, I'm very interested in is um, what most governments do, including the United States, is you, you prepare options, right? So you know, I, I kind of joke that like somewhere on a dusty shelf in the Pentagon is a US invasion plan for Canada. Right, like you know, you never know, right? Just, just have it ready, just in case. Um, and um, did Hamas say, you know, five years ago, we're going to try this political stuff? And Hamas would talk about how it changed some of its, you know, its documents and its policies, and see if that gets us anything. Um, and then when that didn't work, the voices of hardliners within it got stronger. And so there's a question of once it started planning this operation, was it? committed? Or was it like, yeah, it's good to have options on the shelf, and we'll plan, but we probably won't do it unless things go bad politically. And then they um, then they decide to do it. So I think that's a possibility, but, I, but again, I don't know. 
We are just out of time, I think. Um, and I see Professor Press looming over my shoulder. Before you say good evening, I just want to say one thing, which is um, if you found um, what uh, Professor Byman had tonight to, uh, to be, had to say tonight to be interesting and informative, I'd encourage you to pick up this book. Uh, Dan's written many books, and this is not his most recent book, but it's probably the one that's most um, topical uh, to the discussion we've had tonight, um, aptly titled A High Price, um, and I think it's, uh, and many people would agree, the best book uh, on the history of, US, uh, of Israeli terrorism and counterterrorism experience. It is the book I and uh, my students were uh, in the process of reading uh, on October 7th when we learned that our trip to Israel uh, in December would be canceled. But I'm hoping um, that we will go back to Israel um, at some point uh, in the not too distant future that um, Israel and the Palestinian territories will be a more peaceful place um, at that time and that at some point uh, I won't have to ask my students um, to read this excellent book. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ben, for a thoughtful and very, very interesting conversation. Thank you to the audience for terrific questions. Um, please join me in thanking Dan Byman and Ben Valentino.